Harris Board on my sixth site at home. I'd like to welcome everyone to the sixth educational event hosted by the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee. We're pleased that you could all make it. I'd like to take this time to thank members of the advisory committee and the content, content task force for planning this event, particularly Jim Brown, my co-chair for the task force. We'd also like to thank the Internet Caucus co-chairs for their leadership role in supporting this educational work. Senator Burns and Leahy, Congressman Goodlatte and Belcher. As you may know, the Internet Caucus Advisory Committee <clears throat> is a coalition of organizations, not just nonprofits, but also businesses, trade associations, and public interest groups working together to provide education about the Internet and technology. We have some upcoming events uh, this year. Uh, one is a three-part series on the broadband issue, and the other is a speaker series with uh, Tim Evers Lee, father of the World Wide Web, and Meg Whitman, the CEO of eBay. In moving forward, I'd like to introduce you to our distinguished moderator today, Robin Raskin. Robin is the editor-in-chief and founder of Family PC Magazine. She's regarded as one of the country's leading authorities on the integration of technology and the lives of parents and their children. Raskin has crafted a publication that is a must-read guidebook for parents raising the first generation of digital kids. Family PC Magazine has grown to a circulation of over 700,000, reaching an audience of more than 2.2 million readers. Robin is a frequent guest on NBC, MSNBC, Live with Regis and Kelly, CBS Early Show, and Fox's Good Day New York. She's also the author of Parents, Kids, and Computers, Your Child's Education. She's an outspoken advocate for children's safety on the internet. She also serves on the National Research Council Committee, which investigates tools and strategies for protecting kids from pornography and their applicability to other inappropriate internet content. Please join me in welcoming Robin Raskin. So I'm going to go right on with the introduction and introduce our hostess um, um, who has been kind enough to uh, work on this with us, and that's Congresswoman Jennifer Dunn. She's a Republican from Washington State, representing the 8th Congressional District, just east of Seattle, to be a quiz on this afterwards. She's been representing that district since 1992, and she is the bipartisan, she is uh, the head of the Bipartisan Congressional Working Group on Youth Violence. And this was created after the Columbine tragedy in 1999. She also serves on the Economic Committee and the Committee on Ways and Means. And thank you to Jennifer Dunn. Thank you very much, Robin. Well, it's delightful to have you here at HC5, which we claim is our room on this side of the Capitol, for your meetings today. And I know your meetings are past me. It's nice for me to hear Robin's background because uh, there are a lot of us here in the Congress who are very focused on the issue of youth violence. And to know that she is a resource with such an excellent background serves us all very well. Um, the Youth Violence Working Group started a couple of years ago in the Congress. There are 24 of us on the bipartisan level who are involved in this. Martin Cross is the Democratic State Chairman. I am the Republican State Chairman. And we've done some very good work, which includes our assessment of high tech, what we think uh, the high tech community and industry uh, can contribute to this whole effort. And uh, high tech has been a huge savior in many ways. Uh, President Clinton also had a, high, a uh, working group on youth violence. And we are very hopeful that uh, the Attorney General and the President will continue this working group because we're so ready to, to move along on that. Uh, uh, that uh, that has a, a lot of standing, and I think can continue to use your best involvement to get good results. Nothing is more important for parents than, uh, to, than knowing that their children are safe. With new technologies like the internet, it's becoming much more difficult for parents to manage their children's activities in cyberspace, even though when children are getting very bad influences off the internet. You know, and I know, for example, that so often uh, the computers in the kids' room, and who's going to walk in there and know what that child is seeing? 
day in and day out. The internet is fundamentally a great place for children, but there are some areas in cyberspace that are not appropriate for children to be viewing. I know that uh, as a parent myself, and working our way up to Mother's Day, which is one of our very special days of the year, that the most horrendous nightmare any parent can have is if her child were to turn up missing or molested as a result of online contact. And yet, this is happening these days a lot. In most cases, the internet sexual predators are not strangers bursting in the homes of stealing young children. That's the way it used to be. Uh, but rather, they entice our children to leave their homes and meet with these internet predators personally. Last year, in my state, Washington State, a 32 year old man was convicted on rape charges and he was sentenced to a term of 23 years in prison. This gentleman had posed as a 15-year-old boy on the internet. He had persuaded a girl who was only 13 years old to meet him in Seattle after encountering her in an online chat room. Um, fortunately for us, the police offered him the same. They picked this man up, and sure enough, he was somebody who had intentions for this young lady that were not, as a parent would say, appropriate. This scenario can be prevented with some supervision by parents and education about the dangers that can be found on the internet. Many parents use software provided by Microsoft, our hometown company, by N2H2, by Cyber Patrol, NetNanny, to monitor their children's access to the internet. These programs not only uh, can filter out inappropriate content, but they also can provide parents a little bit more control over how much time their child spends on the internet and the types of messages that are being exchanged on the internet. Besides filtering technology, parents can use resources such as GetNetWise and SafeKids.com to educate themselves on the proper and the safe, safe use of the internet. GetNetWise is one of my favorites. That's a partnership between parents and industry uh, leaders and schools. The site provides educational resources so young people can learn how to protect themselves and how to avoid sexual predators. Although great software or a terrific website uh, can never replace good parenting, these resources still offer us some sort of protection. And they really are very real tools uh, that parents can use to ensure that children will enjoy a safe experience when they're online. In the information age, uh, parents, I believe, are speaking as one, are very grateful when the industry comes up with products like DevNetWise uh, that will help us raise savvy and safe and web safe children. We know that government regulation of the internet isn't the solution. You all have debated that many times in the meetings that you hold. Uh, some of the members who you as staff represent are very concerned about overregulation that will put a chill on the industry and will be very careful taking steps like issuing a moratorium on taxing the internet and all kinds of other things to make sure that we don't diminish the wonderful effects of this industry. So government regulation is one way we don't want to go when we talk about the internet. Educational safety tools combined with good communication between parents and children will help protect families from internet predators. This morning I circulated a Dear Colleague letter. You all know what that is. It's a letter that states an article or an opinion that gets around to all the members of the Congress. And they're mostly informational, but they are very much used uh, for background on bills when they're debated on the floor or to get information around that's very important. Uh, I encourage them in my Dear Colleague this morning to link their websites to get, them, to get NetWise so that the people they represent and use this very valuable resource. We're all concerned with helping children avoid dangers on the internet. And one of the most important safety measures is getting children and parents involved and families familiar with the resources that are in their help. Uh, we discuss that all the time. The people at the head table are very aware of that. And I'm here today to tell you that the Congress wants to congratulate you and the industry that have been successful in developing these types of safety uh, programs and that we stand behind you as you continue to do your good work. So as I say, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here today. And uh, I'm sorry that Mary Landry couldn't make it over. She has a comment she wanted to give to you too, but I'm delighted to see you all. Thank you.
try and put a frame to this issue and, and a scope, but Congresswoman Brown has done such a remarkably wonderful job um, at hit, hitting some of the issues. So I think what I can do for you is, um, as a journalist who's been tracking this a long time and working with a lot of these people, frame the scope of the problem for you. And as I was thinking of how to this for you, I said on Charles Dickens would probably throw a fit if he knew I was borrowing his line about political and personal power during the French Revolution and kind of moving it over to high-tech times. But I need to do it because when it comes to the internet, I don't think it's any stretch of the imagination to believe that when historians write about it and characterize it in years to come, they won't really say it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. The people that you are about to hear from for the rest of your lunch um, are the people who have doggedly been working to make sure that when the scales tip and when history gets recorded, it turns out to be the best of times. And um, it's a fine line we walk. So I'm going to introduce you to them in a moment, but as the editor-in-chief of Family PC, I thought what I could do is share a few data points. We regularly speak to parents um, of what I call the first generation of truly digital kids, kids that never even do life before computers. We conduct workshops in the school, and we have a panel of over 15,000 families that gauge the temperature of prevailing attitudes. Overwhelmingly, and that's about 90% of the parents I speak with, they agree that the internet is a marvelous tool for providing their children with access to learning, the global village, and jobs of the future. But those very same parents worry that computers, when used ineffectively, can do everything from cycle the imagination, to foster antisocial behavior, and at its worst, expose children to harmful and dangerous elements that could, at their worst, result in physical or psychological harm. We calculate, and this is ever-changing, but probably less than 1% of the internet we can say is inappropriate for children, be it pornography, hate, or violent content. But we know that it's an incredibly vocal, high-profile, and well-traveled percent. We know that the majority of our kids will probably be able to handle the internet's darkest corners without serious repercussions. But we know when there are incidents, they can, and they have been horrific. We suspect that our children know a lot more about the unsavory parts of the internet than we like, and typically a lot more than we know. Our knowledge of technology, I'd like to tell our readers, is kind of like the immigrant newcomers, and where our kids have been drained from birth. So let me toss out a few data points. In our recent surveys that we've done with teenagers and their parents, nine out of 10 teens that we spoke with agree that the internet makes their lives easier. easier. 52%, more than half of them, agree that there are negative aspects to the internet. 63% have received inappropriate content online without ever seeking it. 53%, more than half, have seen a pornographic website. Now, 10% of those admit that it was on purpose. Boys being six times as likely as girls to admit that it was on purpose. <laughs> But the irony here is that parents are really in the dark on this one, with 38% um, of them believing their children have ever seen anything inappropriate online. So if you contrast the kids' response and the parents' response, there's quite a big gap there. 64% of parents say that they monitor their kids' web activity in some way. But it's primarily done through family rules, discussion, and some rules about acceptable use in the home. Only 20% of our readers, and they are probably the most technologically savvy families, use parental control. Of that 27%, only 6% actually buy commercial parental control software. The majority of those are AOL parental control users. Um, and I think you'll hear AOL numbers are a little different than our readers, and you may hear about that later. So despite all the widespread availability of internet filtering software, only 6% of parents are actually going out and buying commercially available software. The problem of inappropriate content on the web, as you're about to hear, is an unbelievably complicated one with many tentacles. Social scientists are working to ascertain both the long and short-term damage from exposure to these elements. The technology industry, ISPs, filtering software companies, and children's websites are struggling with the internet's fundamental underpinning. As long as you guarantee end-to-end -end anonymity, it's difficult to restrict certain populations, including children, to view only certain parts of the internet. Law enforcement officials are racing to keep up with new forms of high-tech misconduct, hacking, stalking, identity theft. Legislators, as we've seen in recent history, have to navigate that fine line between freedom of speech and a parent's right to protect and monitor their children. 
educators who developed some wonderful media literacy tools find it hard to disseminate and address the masses as they rush onto the online world. And as the nuances of chat and instant messaging change with frightening regularity, the one thing we know for sure is that kids will always be one step ahead and always prone to new dangers. So the conversation is never ending. And to top it off, and this is a real plea to everybody here, despite wonderful content, there's little economic incentive for crafting safe, inviting, compelling internet spaces for kids. So along with eliminating the bad, we've got to concentrate on creating the good. The bottom line, I think it's clear, and I think we realize that the economic implications of a country where kids who are not allowed to access the internet, either through economic situations or parental fear, are given less of a chance than their internet savvy counterparts is not something that we want. And I think that what we have, that's what we avoid by having these discussions. So this update that you're going to get will no doubt be sobering, probably migraine producing in its complexity. But it should give you some great satisfaction to know that some of the best thinkers on this issue, either from the high tech sector, law enforcement, legislators, or educators, have made incredible, many incredible strides towards reaching a consensus about how to best ensure that the internet is as safe for our kids as possible, and that parents, as with any media, have some control and some responsibility for what their kids are exposed to. I hope you'll listen and listen carefully, and then we'll have a rousing Q&A um, where our speakers can share their knowledge with you. So with that, I'm going to introduce our first panel of speakers, and they represent the COPA Commission. For those of you um, who don't know, the COPA Commission was formed uh, to look into the problem of internet safety, issued their report in the fall. Um, the report is critically important to understanding um, the multiple parts of this issue, and I uh, think what you'll hear today is a recap and a current, uh, an update on um, the COPA Commission's findings. So I'm going to start um, with a uh, wonderful guy, Don Talaj. Don is currently the Executive Advisor for Global Internet Strategy at Network Solutions, Inc., NSI. Um, he's been a leading industry strategist on the evolution of the administration, the structure of the internet required for continual, continued commercial growth. He's also the senior spokesman for NSI's Net Strategy and the author of the detailed policy publications on these matters. And Don labored terrifically and um, managed to find consensus where I think initially there wasn't a whole lot in, when, when the COPA Commission first got together. So with no further ado, I'll introduce Don Law. I'd like to, uh, first of all, take an opportunity to thank uh, all the key staff I see who took the time to come here today, especially some of the staff in the commission. Uh, it's really nice to know that even after your job ended, you still take the time to come. That was great. I'd like to open up with uh, asking you a question. You know, you, we all know about uh, Letterman's uh, ten, li 10 list, you know, things not to do. Well, what's the number one thing not to do you happen to belong to a congressional commission. The answer is, don't ever sign on to the organizational meeting by teleconference from Cairo while they're making decisions about how to structure. Because you will be selected as chairman and you won't even know the quality of the weight. And that's exactly what happened to me last March 7th. So I was pleased to be selected, but I have to tell you I was more than a little concerned. After having seen the tax commission and how that worked, and how wonderful the party goal got along there, and if you want some great reading, you should go read that report. Okay. Uh, after reading that and having known that the participants who were selected in this commission had been pretty much in opposition, split down the middle for about the last five years, okay, I knew that my challenges were set before me. You add to that the fact that we had no designated agency support because there was some defect in the legislation, no funding, and no ability to do gifts and grants. Okay? Aside from those small minor issues, it was a cakewalk. Okay? The commission had six months to do its job. Okay? Even though it was formed in October of 98, we didn't really get all the nominations made by Congress. So we really only had six months. From March 7th, till the end of October. And I can't begin to tell you what an incredible job these people did. This was a very, very difficult issue. 
And the secret to doing the job that we did was to ask ourselves the following important question. Was it the right thing to do to try and get everybody on this side of the issue to convince everybody on that side of the issue that they were wrong, or conversely, okay? Or was it the right thing to do to try and look in a really do a technical evaluation of all of the possible ways that one might use to protect children and see if there was common ground, see if there was low-hanging fruit, okay, that we hadn't done yet, that hadn't been effective yet, that no one had bothered in the spirited debate, in the litigation, in the rush to legislate, okay, what are there in fact things that were really valuable, useful, that could have an impact? And that's exactly what the commission did. We spent a lot of time carefully crafting our uh, set of technologies and methods. We came up with 18. They're outlined in the report in detail. I enforced a methodology and a discipline on this commission. They put I mean, You'll hear stories if you talk to some of the staff about the discipline that we imposed on the commission. Basically, we were focused. We knew what the shape and size and structure and outline of the report was going to be from the second meeting. So we basically worked towards writing the report for conducting the hearing. In the six month period, we had three two day public hearings one in Washington, D.C., one in Richmond, Virginia, at the university there, and one in San Jose. To spread it out. We had four other meetings, several days long, each of them, where I made the commission in a full public view basically talk to each other, deliberate, okay, publicly about. Well, how they felt about the particular issues using a tool, a powerful tool that we had built, forcing them, in fact, see what they said and defend their own positions on things. It was an amazing revelation on how these things work. For me, it was a, such a striking example of how if you want to get progress, you have to get people talking to each other. Is it enough to throw grenades over the transom? Okay in court, or is it enough to try and lobby legislation, you really make progress when people sit down in a room and they basically roll up their sleeves and they tell each other how they feel. That was a, an amazing experience. It was very painful. No one who was on this commission, okay, hadn't felt that pain. It was very hard to look someone in the eye who had been fighting with for five years on an issue and try and develop a respect for their position an understanding of the position. What was remarkable to me was how the commission members moved together. They converged on the really important stuff. This commission came up with 12 unanimously supported important recommendations. This commission took a snapshot in time at the end of the century and evaluated 18 technologies and methods. In order to do that, you know, we had the three hearings we had seven public meetings that we conducted. We had 87 witnesses who testified in front of this commission, including uh, Senator Lieberman, who, who took time from his schedule. Uh, Senator Lander was also scheduled to testify, but again, had a, a difficulty he couldn't make it. We had 11 supplemental statements that were submitted, 35 research papers were submitted, and we evaluated 18 very detailed technologies and methods. In the, in the report that we're going to be given today, you'll see that there's a graphical representation. So you can actually take a snapshot and look at how those were evaluated. And they were evaluated against seven criteria. Everything from First Amendment issues, privacy issues, law enforcement issues, cost issues, okay, and effectiveness of measures. And so it's a really important cross-section of the good and the bad, okay, of the technology. And this commission did not recommend any further legislation. The sense was, let the commission, let the Congress read the report, okay, let's see if we can implement the low-hanging fruit, and that will be the kind of first step that's required before we make a further step to see if the problem can solve itself. I think the last thing I want to leave you with is that the two gentlemen you're going to hear from in a moment, okay, were incredible supporters of different positions, but strongly held positions on the commission. And I can't tell you how much respect I have personally developed in working with them and the people who supported their point of view. I took the role of the chairman very, very seriously. 
right. I was nominated for this commission by both parties, okay, by both chambers, okay, and I selected one of those nominations because it came at the right time for me to select. But so it was clear to pretty much everybody on this commission that my political agenda was not going to be present in these discussions. My job was to get the absolute best out of the time that we had and the best out of this commission staff, and that was what I tried to do. So I'd like to thank you very much for coming. I want to urge you to read the report, and I want to ask you if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate. Go to our website, www.copacommission.org. Contact data is there for me. Okay, I'm more than willing to come in and brief you or your staff to give you the right down the middle view on the commission. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Um, I'm going to introduce Bob Flores next. To, I actually met when he was in Manhattan as the uh, ADA and uh, the district, uh, district attorney. And he was the first person that really let me recognize what a serious problem at its worst this, this could be and um, how hard and how complicated some of the issues around prosecuting some of these things are. Bob is the senior counsel for the National Law Center for Children and Families. Prior to the Law Center, he served as acting, acting Deputy Chief of Child Exploitation and Obscenity Sessions for the Department of Justice Criminal Division. He was a federal prosecutor with the session for about eight years. Before that, he served, as I said, as the Assistant District Attorney in Manhattan. And in that capacity, he successfully prosecuted several highly publicized child sexual abuse cases including a major child prostitution network and a millionaire philanthropist who operated a nonprofit organization in which he seduced and sexually abused children. Um, so I introduce you to Bob Flores. Robin, thank you for that uh, introduction. And, uh, thanks to the Congressional Internet Caucus and the Congressman Dunn uh, for uh, leadership in this issue, and uh, I'm pleased to uh, appear before you this afternoon to just share some thoughts about the work of the commission. Um, I would uh, just like to point out to you two uh, different places in the report that I'd like you to take a look at if you don't have a chance to take a look at everything. Uh, and on page 36, um, there was a unanimous recommendation of the commission, uh, and again, the commission represented both sides of the aisle, uh, people who come at this issue uh, from very different perspectives, but it really is uh, a call on uh, the federal government to do a better job of going after uh, those who are specifically providing the material which is illegal, which is causing harm to children. Um, and I think that one of the things that uh, caused us to have a unanimous view on that was that it focused on the, uh, on the actual criminal activity as opposed to uh, perhaps uh, the internet service provider who might be the transport of it um, or some other uh, person in the chain. Uh, there was a call unanimously to really address uh, those who provide obscene material, those who provide material which is harmful to children in a way which is in fact criminal. Uh, there's also a recommendation in there that addresses uh, really fraudulent marketing and, and uh, uh, unfair trade practices and the need to address those from mouse trapping and hijacking. I mean, uh, even today, it's uh, certainly the case where you can go online, uh, go to a website, and find yourself someplace where you really can't get out unless you, um, for somebody who's a, a simple internet user like myself, just to uh, press the reset button on your computer and start again. Uh, not able to get out uh, quickly enough to satisfy myself or uh, to, to get the job done. I would like to just uh, point out that I look at this problem really as a big marshmallow. Um, it's, it's really soft on a lot of sides, and if you squeeze only from one direction, it just kind of oozes out into another place. And I think that there are really, one of the things the Commission looked at is the need to do a number of things. I'm a parent. Uh, many of you in this room are parents. Um, the staffers, though, are pretty young, so you're probably not there yet. But um, uh, this is a concern. How many uh, times will my children be targeted? My uh, six-year-old loves to play on the computer. It's a toy for him. It's not uh, something that's intimidating. It's not something that he's afraid of. If I let him stay on the computer, he would stay there uh, almost all day. Uh, so I need to educate my, chil my children. 
Um, my daughters, uh, one and four, are uh, frequent uh, uh, watchers of my son. Uh, whenever they get the opportunity, they're on. They don't want to get off. Uh, there's a lot of crying in the house when the computer finally is turned off. Uh, but they're, they're, they love that thing. And uh, I hope that their desire to learn how to use it, um, to benefit from it, will continue as they get older. But there is a need, certainly, to educate them about the dark side. And that's difficult to do when you are talking about such a young population. And it's not really all that easier as they get older. Because one of the great things about being a teenager is that you're made of steel and you live forever. Uh, there is no risk that is too great. Uh, and everything always happens to someone else. And so that is the, it, that's a challenge that I don't yet have to face. But um, we're, we're uh, getting there quickly. Law enforcement certainly has to do its job. Uh, and quite frankly, from my vantage point, it has not done that. A part of it is that it is out-resourced at every stage of the game. Uh, there are many people who want to do many things on the internet which are not helpful to you or me or society in general. And law enforcement, as hard as they might try, are not catching up very quickly. I think they're not catching up at all. Technology. I do think that filters, blocking software, the whole uh, panoply of technological um, opportunities and options have to be pursued and they have to be developed. Now, there's a lot of consternation right now over the Child Internet Protection Act. Uh, there's going to be litigation on that, and I certainly will be interested to see how that turns out. But the bottom line is that uh, that technology is not going to disappear, whether SEPA does or not. Uh, that technology has to be exploited, and it's being used, quite frankly, all over the country, primarily by businesses. Uh, businesses who are afraid of lawsuits, businesses that are afraid of uh, having their bottom line disrupted. And so I do think that that is a, a very powerful indicator that the technology is effective. It is not without its problems, but it is effective. And so the question has to be, how do we balance that in any particular setting? I think the commission was uh, fair in how it looked at that, and I would direct you to page 18, uh, its review of client-side filters. Finally, I think the fair uh, trade practices issue is, is something that is just now uh, starting to get a hard look. And I think it's important for uh, the government to take a look at that, for state attorneys general to look at that issue, because it's one thing uh, for someone to go out and look for a particular type of material, whether that's a 12-year-old or 13-year-old who shouldn't be doing it, or someone else. Uh, it's quite another to be confronted, hijacked, uh, and uh, just really taken against your will uh, and have that plastered. And now, it doesn't have to just be pornography. I mean, this is uh, what brought us to the commission. But part of the issue here is that there's a tremendous amount of information that's out there that uh, without uh, the ability to really re uh, consider it, against a, perhaps a lifetime of education is hurtful. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of information. I have two daughters uh, that um, portrays women in, in, uh, in ways that are really just almost unimaginable, except that it's there on the screen, uh, and there's an increasing amount. Uh, so as we consider uh, youth violence, as we consider uh, education issues, as we consider funding at every level. I think that these issues will not go away. And I would encourage you to do basically what we did at the commission. Become a player. Uh, those of you who are staffs, uh, who are here from the Senate or from the House, uh, ask your member to consider putting on some part of this information, some reference perhaps, in the next mailer that goes out. Snail mail is still uh, used in this country. Um, a lot of people rely on it. And a lot of people read what your members send out. Every time they send a mailing, they read it. Uh, and so it's important. That's one of the ways that you can help educate. And I look forward to today's discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, and just to give you a snapshot of what, what's to come, we're going to hear from one more uh, member of the COBA Commission. And that's Jerry Berman, who I'll introduce in a moment. And then we're going to move to panelists who will update us on industry perspectives, <laughs> uh, education perspectives, and um, enforcement perspectives. So we'll move to a more discussion format uh, momentarily. 
But I'd like to introduce Jerry Berman. Jerry is um, a member of the COPA Commission and also the Executive Director for the Center for Democracy and Technology, cdt.org, correct, Jerry? It is, it has become a, 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 a central nerve um, for all internet policy decisions. As journalists, we use this site frequently and often to make sure that um, we understand precisely what's coming going on in Washington. CDT's free speech and privacy policy working groups um, comprised of communications firms, associations, civil liberties groups, address internet policy issues. Jerry also chairs the advisory committee to the Congressional Internet Caucus, and Jerry has coordinated the successful Citizen Internet Empowerment Coalition Challenge to the Communications Decency Act. And so where there's legislation <coughs> efforts regarding the internet, you can usually find Jerry Berman there, and so we will introduce him now. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I was standing up because in many of these events, I, I have the moderator's chair as the, as the head of the advisory committee to the caucus, but now I'm um, wearing my COPA commission hat. But also, uh, I think we need to emphasize why the commission reached almost unanimous consensus that the solution is at the parent side, wise with technology tools, and education rather than with legislative solutions such as the Communications Decency Act or even harmful to minor statutes. Uh, it, and I want to make it first clear that I am speaking when we see there's a lot of material which is seen. There's uh, child pornography on the on the internet that's covered by law. It's it's illegal. It needs strong law enforcement. But there is this large gray area of sexually explicit hate speech and so forth, which raises significant constitutional issues when you try to regulate it, and it poses unique problems when you try to regulate it on the internet. The internet is a global medium, it's decentralized, and that efforts to try and capture and hold that uh, content and make the content provider try to keep it away from children. When the Supreme Court wrestled with that, the only way to do that was to keep it away from adults, and that violated their constitutional rights. Um, even if you could declare it illegal in the United States to put sexually explicit content up, um, or try to rate it, what would be the rating system in a global system? If you could make it illegal in the United States, much of the material is coming in from abroad. It's a global medium. A website in the United States looks like a website overseas. So even a legal approach uh, in the United States would not be effective in the global medium. So the whole emphasis of, of the commission was to look at ways that parents and users can, can be empowered to protect their children. That was the emphasis uh, on, uh, they looked at the many tools None of them can be warranted as totally effective. Uh, uh, there are, uh, as Robin Raskin has pointed out, many parents still do not use them. There is uh, still not a great take-up rate for them uh, that we would like. And the commission came down heavily that that is where we need to focus our energy. Um, and, uh, and I have to emphasize that again today, I think Congress can do a great deal of uh, working with industry to drive uh, the education message to the users on the internet. Parents need to be more internet literate. Uh, lots of companies could do a lot more to send, uh, whether it's CD-ROM disk or information, uh, with their package with their computer, package with, with their software, package with their online service. Uh, which give parents these tools and help them understand how easy they are to, to put them on their computer and make them part of the transparent experience of their children. It also requires education. The Department of Education, the Justice Department, HHS, they haven't done as much as they can, whether it's public service announcements, whether it's education programs, whether it's appearing on the internet and providing information themselves to get an educated uh, parental 
constituency out there can take advantage of the only potentially effective way uh, to keep this content out of the home. We work with, uh, as a nonprofit, with AOL and others in industry to, to put up the GetNet Y site. It has uh, millions of people have come and visited that site for tools and good content and law information on how to reach law enforcement is, is listed. But we, Jennifer Douglas here said that she does, sent out another dear colleague to members of Congress. So we have not been able to persuade a majority of the Congress, which is concerned about this issue, to put Get Net Wise up on their site. So when their constituents come to that site, they can find it and go and get help. If we can't get members of Congress to focus on it, we can't get, um, other than the, 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 the band of industries that, have, that have put the resources, which is not a large percentage of the internet, uh, to put up the resources to try and build sites like Get Net Wise. If we can't get uh, the government to focus on the, and put up the resources for the education, we're not going to get the job done. Um, and it is in the interest of uh, the internet it's the interest of public interest and the interest of our children that we get that done and that we and it's also in the interest of the first amendment that we get it done in the right way in order to keep congress from coming back to easy solutions which are very attractive uh, high visibility cause a lot of heat but then involve a lot of resources um, in the court and uh, and uh, tend to be struck down as unconstitutional. We have to deal with the constitutional reality, the reality of a decentralized global medium, and really get serious about uh, the educational recommendations that the Commission made. Thank you. And I urge you all to look in your kits and read um, the COPA Commission's report. Um, it's, it's graphic. It's, it gives you one of the Kind of best snapshot you will find of the, the debate around this issue ever. You also um, have a magazine that you picked up on the way in. That's uh, one of our, my sister publications, Yahoo Internet Light. They're, this month they focused on sex and censorship online, so I thought it was good supplemental reading. And as you leave, um, our family PC magazine just arrived where we looked at a number of the filtering tools available and rated them as to their efficiency through our family testers. So that might be helpful reading on this issue as well. Um, and um, now we'll move into a part of the session where I'm going to ask you guys to stay in your seats. We're going to try and talk from where you are. And um, we're going to shortly ask you all to, um, if, if you have questions, but this is really um, to look a step further at some of the issues that the commission's raised. And we're going to look at the notion of empowerment in education, the notion of enforcement, and then a look at what the industry is doing. And to do this, I don't think we could have found better people to um, talk to us. Um, I'm going to start here. This is Larry Maggot. Larry's a syndicated columnist since, since forever, since 1983, since I've known him. Larry's columns uh, originate in the LA Times and the San Jose Mercury News, but appear in newspapers and websites everywhere. Columnist from Micro Times, CBS, uh, television, radio. Suffice it to say that if there's a tech talk show and it revolves around the internet and technology, Larry has probably been there. Larry's also done some um, amazing work as the author of some important websites, larrysworld.com, safekids.com, and safeteens.com. He's been on the board of director for the National Center of Ex Missing and Exploited Children and done some wonderful work there, uh, helping them implement some great technology. He's the author of Child Safety on the Information Highway and Teen Safety on the Information Highway, which are free book booklets available from the National Center. And um, he's also the author of the safety guide that you've uh, heard, uh, that appears on the site you've heard referred to so much today, getnetwise.org. Michael Heimbach is the Unit Chief Crimes Against Children, uh, Children's Unit, uh, part of the FBI. And um, Michael's going to talk to us about enforcement and his new position. Uh, before that position, he served in New Orleans Division of the FBI for 12 years, assigned to investigate a variety of federal violations, including as a supervisor for the Special Operations Group and the New Orleans Gang Task Force. And David Eisner is the Vice President of Corporate Relations from America Online. 
Um, America Online, I like to say, so America Online Warner. Right, it hasn't rolled off the tongue yet. America Online Time Warner. And um, I, I do like to say, as America Online goes, so goes the nation when it comes to the internet. Our kids are more savvy in block messages, notifications, IMs, chain mail, and any other thing. Um, I guess Madonna's tickets the other day brought uh, America Online Time Warner almost to its knees. Um, nothing travels faster than news on America Online, and what they've uh, done um, to, um, they haven't taken this responsibility lightly. And um, Dick, that a lot of that reason that they haven't is because of David and some of the programs that America Online has instituted. So I'm gonna start with Larry, and I'll pose the first question and, and have them um, each give a little answer so we can root this in reality and then open it up to you for questions. Um, so to Larry, let, my question is this, Larry, you, you built these websites, Safe Teens and, and um, uh, uh, Safe Kids, and what do you think has been the effect of having these safe havens for kids information? Well, Robin, I think that you really summarized it well when you gave the data point, when you talked about how uh, an overwhelming, you know, 863% of uh, teens or parents understand that there are bad things on the internet, but then pointed out that only 20% use parental controls, and most of those are with AOL, where they're sort of put there automatically for you. Uh, your number, I think, 6% by filters. In many ways, this issue is a mile wide and an inch deep. It's a mile wide in that virtually everyone you ask will acknowledge that it's important, and certainly here in Washington, a great amount of attention has been paid in terms of legislation, but it's an inch deep because when you ask somebody to do something about it, they're not likely to do much. Now, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that as parents, and I am a parent of two teenagers, we have a tendency to want to trust our children and want to realize that our children are somehow net savvy and have read booklets like Child Safety and Information Highway and been to get that wise and somehow know what to do. But I think we also realize that just as parent, teenagers have a tendency to think that these problems are somehow going to happen to someone else, as parents we have a tendency to think that these problems are going to have to happen to someone else's kids. And unfortunately, uh, those someone else's include parents who, who often are the ones uh, that are affected. In fact, I was on a television show with a parent who, uh, whose child had been abducted. And the, the host of the show asked me to talk about rules for online safety, and of course I did. And then the parent looked at me and said, Larry, we read your booklet. We follow those rules, and our daughter is still missing. And that parent, I, I could say essentially nothing, but what I thought about is sometimes you wear your seatbelt, you, you drive sober, you use your airbag, and then still bad things happen. But I think that what's important here is that we understand <coughs> that some effect is happening, that, that the education that's been going on really ever since the National Center for Missing Exploited Children published Child Safety for the Information Highway back in early 1994, that the word has gotten out. When, when we put out that booklet, uh, people really hadn't put much thought into it. When you ask folks about internet safety, uh, they didn't really think much about it. When you ask so-called experts, you had two reactions. Uh, there were some folks, uh, some in law enforcement and others, who felt that the only way to protect a child from the internet was to yank the modem out of the wall and keep them offline. And there were other folks within the industry who felt that there really were no dangers, there really were, were no problems. And I think, uh, as indicated by the, um, by, by the COPA Commission, that even when you take a, a group with very broad, uh, diverse political positions, a group that has argued amongst itself for many years, that we do have some consensus that yes, indeed, the internet is a marvelous, wonderful institution, we just have an institution, marvelous, wonderful resource, yet there are dangers. And I think that well, we have reached that consensus. But when it comes to what to do about it, that's where I think we're in a very difficult situation. Certainly, most of the parents that I talk to are aware, if not of GetNetWise or SaveKids.com, they certainly are aware of the messages. They certainly understand the concept that their children uh, can be in danger. I, I think another thing that we have to think about before I give up the microphone is that it's very important to pick your priorities, that a lot of people focus on pornography on the internet. When I say pornography right now, I'm talking about legal adult pornography, not child pornography. And that is indeed a problem. As a parent of two teenagers, obviously I am concerned about the psychological and social impact on my children, and I would prefer that they not look at certain pornography on the internet. And part of the problem is that some of the pornography that we have on the internet is not your father's dirty magazine. This is not the playboys that my generation grew up with. This is stuff which uh, basically fantasizes and advocates 
uh, activities that have carried out could be disruptive and non-consensual. Uh, that's different than advocating or fantasizing activities when carried out by consenting adults are actually somewhat pleasurable to all parties, or can be. And so I think that we need to be aware of the fact that that is an issue. But we also have to be aware that, as uh, Congressman Dunn pointed out, there are some very horrific situations. And it's very important, whether we're talking about education or we're talking about law enforcement, that we really focus on the critical issues here. That certain things make us feel uncomfortable as parents, as uh, educators, as legislators, and other things make us basically feel in terror. And we need to really prioritize when it comes to legislation, when it comes to social policy, protect children against predators, protect children against those who do them harm, and be very, very cautious uh, as you think about how to protect children and adults against things that we may feel uncomfortable about. Frankly, uh, trying to keep children away from sexually explicit material on the internet uh, through legislation and laws is probably about as effective as keeping adults away from alcohol through a constitutional amendment. Uh, it's obviously something that we try as parents to do, but as a uh, <coughs> social policy and the government, it's extremely difficult to do, and as we work for thinking about child safety in the internet, we really need to focus on the priorities, which is why I'm so happy to see we have somebody here from the FBI. Uh, we need to really support law enforcement, you know, in, in basically enforcing the laws, keeping the predators under control, getting that child pornography, which is illegal, out of our homes, uh, and really getting the people. Uh, as a board member of the National Center for Missing Exploited Children, I work very hard with my colleagues to try to encourage law enforcement and support law enforcement. Uh, that is extremely important, but again, it's very important to separate the issue of enforcing laws and protecting children against predators uh, from the issue of how we deal with speech on the internet to make us feel uncomfortable. Thanks, Larry. And I, I want to um, focus on something that Larry does that he didn't say, which is a site for safe kids and a site for safe teens. And I urge you when you think about this problem, don't think of kids as one lump group. There are different kids at different ages who deserve different rights and responsibilities. And, and uh, you know, we um, actually just came back with the National Academy of Sciences from a visit to Blacksburg, Virginia, where the high school told us that they need information. The high school kids said they need information on abortions. They need information on sexuality. They need information not only to do the reports, but to live their lives and have a right to that information. So what Larry does on the websites is very important in their age differentiation. So. Um, Moving on to Michael Heinbeck, who represents the FBI, um, I think some of the best information that um, the FBI can tell us is to give us a sense of, one, how real this problem is, and two, what are the obstacles to handling the online version of, this, of, um, of the problems with uh, child pornography and, and child um, abuse and, uh, and preying and stalking in particular versus the physical world where the FBI is probably a little more comfortable and used to doing their job. So, Michael? Well, the, the scope of the, uh, the crime problem always is very difficult for us to measure, but we can tell you that back in 96, when we really started delving into this on the online business, we worked about uh, 113 cases. We've seen the 1,261% of the cases we worked. Last year, we worked over 1,543 cases. That's just dealing with the sexual exploitation of children online. We went to dedicating maybe around 38 agents to last fiscal year in 2000. We dedicated over two, uh, 115 agents to this cause. Right now, this all started back in 1995 in Baltimore, and we call the undercover operation our Innocent Images Initiative. We've expanded that due to the scope of the crime problem that we're facing uh, to 23 undercover operations as of last week. So that means in 23 of our 56 field offices, uh, we focus on going online, checking predicated websites, uh, chat rooms, uh, going off all the cyber tips that the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children refers to us, which is phenomenal numbers. I think it's three to 4,000 a month that we get. Um, and then, you know, some of the hurdles that we face, um, we have uh, different legislative issues. One, one issue that we tackle, and we understand the concerns of the internet service providers, is there's no rule out there that they maintain any of their records. And sometimes it's very difficult for law enforcement. When we're going back and we get a website, and the website it goes up, it's shut down. And then we go in with an administrative subpoena or a grand jury subpoena and ask for the information, it's gone. So that thwarts us many times to try to find out and, and go back 
to really who's responsible for putting this pornography on. And we understand the financial burdens that come with that. But we in law enforcement, being a former drug agent that worked uh, wiretap investigations, uh, when I did wiretaps and drug investigations, many of the phone companies kept records for years for us. And it seems the same could be with our this industry, which would help us on, on that side of the house to really have somewhat of an impact. In saying on what Larry said too about prioritizing, we just see that the numbers are so vast with say the simple possessors of child porn. So we have to shift our efforts to go after really to try to have an impact on this issue. So we've shifted some focus in this past fiscal year we're going to look at, really look at some entities and organizations or enterprises that are responsible for this. You may have heard there was a case run out of uh, Dallas, which the FBI was involved with uh, U.S. Postal Service, which was called Operation uh, Landslide. It was Landslide Inc. It was a husband and wife that netted $1.2 million a month in a pay-for website. This is kind of the entities that we are trying to focus on and identify how many web, how many enterprises. I don't want to mean to imply that organized crime is behind it or Asian organized crime. It could be just a husband and wife, it could be two people, but I can tell you there's many pay for websites out there that we're going to focus. A lot of the issue too that we face is many of them originate in foreign countries. So that's an issue that we have to tackle. We and the FBI interact on a very continuous basis with international law enforcement. But as you may or may know, laws in the different countries create different obstacles. It may be legal to have consensual sex in Russia with a 13 year old and for them to have child pornography. And then it comes over to our websites. But that's, that's the issues that we face. We do interact with them continuously. We're involved in an Interpol specialist group where we interact with 50 different countries. Believe me, the issues are not unique to the United States. They're worldwide, and everybody's trying to tackle this, this issue. In the most recent Newsweek article, it was commenting is, is this just a new phenomenon? Where, where did this come from? I think it's been around. It's just that the internet has provided a new medium for us to basically, in a positive way, infiltrate their dark area and try to target them and focus on them. So the FBI, with the limited amount of resources we have, uh, we, we dedicate, in my program, in Crimes Against Children, this is just one piece of the pie. We do all the child abductions, all the international parental kidnappings, all the uh, white slave trafficking, yeah, child prostitution, child sex tourism is another big, another big issue with some of our Latin American countries that we work with closely. Uh, we handle all the national sex offender registry. We handle all the deadbeat dads, the Child Support Recovery Act. All this is handled by 300 agents nationwide. Difficult when you're talking the amount of uh, complaints that we receive. So uh, hopefully, uh, Robin, that answers your question. Uh, Before the event ends so great, as I promised. Um, and, um, and our last um, panel member is uh, David Eisner from AOL. And I think I'm just going to ask David to give you an update on how AOL what type of programs they've instituted to handle this vast responsibility of um, basically every parent in America looking to them to help protect their kids. Thank you very much, and thanks to everyone for coming. This is a really important thing to be talking about. I, I do want to say, though, um, uh, as much as it pleases me to talk about AOL, I'd like to talk a little more broadly about uh, what the industry is doing, because it's pretty much everything that AOL has done is meaningful in the space. We've been joined by important partners, AT&T, Microsoft, um, Disney, and others, because all of us agree that none of our individual services or our individual programs to are uh, useful if we create sort of these safe communities in our area and the rest of the internet, uh, in fact, is not safe. From AOL, Time Warner Business point of view, it's critical for us to become a category, the internet become a category with, that is safe. But it's critical for us to be working, therefore, in a broad partnership with um, the rest of the industry, which is why uh, we, along with, with AT&T here at Microsoft, are co-chairs of GetNetWise, which is one of the, um, as you've heard today, one of the critical um, tools for public education around this issue. We look at really three aspects um, in this area that we have to accomplish. One is we need to build more and better user-empowered tools. And at 
AOL and also the other companies have done really, I think, a terrific job in several years of making the tool easier to use. And uh, whereas they started off being pretty strong parental control tools, we're now seeing that we're able to grapple a little bit by making some of these empowerment tools available to kids. So on AOL, for example, we're finding that kids love the ability to block IMs and to put in uh, screen names of people or to just do yes lists so that they can only get IMs from kids that they want to. They also love the tools that get, allow them to notify the internet service provider on, on AOL. We call it Notify AOL. And parents and kids like the idea that whether they're an email or chat rooms or IMs, and if something happens, they have an immediate button uh, to help. Some of the good news that we're seeing in terms of the user empowerment tools is that the cycle is shortening, where parents are becoming aware. It used to be that an average <coughs> AOL member would usually need to be online for three or four years before they could get kind of wrestling with these issues. Now we're finding that it's much faster. And part of it is because we've moved um, uh, some of the notification up front. Right now, if you're an AOL member and you create an additional screen name for a kid or anyone else, but you, you cannot um, take that action without going through a series uh, of discussions. Is this screen name for um, a younger person? Uh, if so, here's what we recommend. Here's how we recommend you control that account. Um, and the parent has to make the affirmative decision. So we really have, since you know we started this and we had about 10 million members, now we're at about 30. So two thirds of our member base at this point has made the affirmative decision about what level of parental controls they want to put on those accounts. And of course, we're incorporating uh, GetNetWise, which gives them access to a much broader variety of tools at every, at every moment. So user empowerment is critical, but the other aspect is public education. And I think uh, Jerry Berman did really a terrific job of pleading for your help. This is an area where um, I think the assistance from Congress can't, can't be overemphasized. If you are talking to your constituents, and your constituents are interested in how they can help their communities and their families, you can do terrific work, first of all, by going directly to the constituents with GetNetWise, either in your um, uh, postal patrons or on your um, website. But also, you can help us begin to expand our industry focus. Right now, frankly, it's the more heavily resourced players in the industry that are able to and have focused on this. But it's important to make it broader. And we hope that as you talk to other players in the internet industry, in information technology, in computer manufacturing, and so on, that you're holding them to task for are they doing their role as part of the industry to focus on this broader issue about kids' safety. And finally, um, as you just heard, we have the user empowerment tools, public education, and finally law enforcement. Again, the industry is taking really enormous steps here. We are, we in, uh, I think it was 97, we announced uh, zero tolerance policy. Ever since then, every single internet service provider has um, pledged to notify law enforcement of any case that comes to our attention related to child pornography or solicitation. Many of us are going much farther. Um, we hold many training sessions per year with members of local, state, law enforcement, FBI, Interpol, Customs, and others. We've done videos to help teach them not only how to catch, but how to prosecute, preserve evidence, identify problems. So we think we're making strides. Um, it's a critical area to focus on, and I think that in particular, <coughs> to the extent that Congress can help focus on the public education side, both for industry and for consumers, and to the extent that Congress can give organizations like the FBI more resources to be able to catch up with this exploding uh, issue, we would, we would really appreciate it. Okay, we have about 20 minutes left to be together, and I'd like to turn it over to, was that a bad thing to say? Um, I was feeling so good that we were actually on time in Washington and right on schedule, but I'd like to open it up to questions from people in the audience to our panelists and speakers. 
And um, I'll call, I actually know Herb Lynn, like to introduce him for me. Herb is the um, senior researcher on the National Academy of Sciences study uh, that's looking at um, strategies and tools for in to protect children from inappropriate uses of technology, including pornography. And this report will be issued in 2000, fall 2002? No. Um, February, you do it. Right. Um, there's a flyer on the, on the National Academy's project out there. Um, uh, it's a congressionally uh, requested study for the National Academy of Sciences to do. We have a uh, blue ribbon panel um, chaired by uh, former governor and former attorney general uh, Dick Thornburg. Um, we're looking to have the, uh, the report out first quarter, as, soon, er, as early in first quarter as possible, um, 02, that's next year. Um, it's not too late to have people submit uh, emails and, and testimony and information to us. All that information is, is on here. Um, and if anybody wants to talk about the project and uh, what, what we're trying to, to do, um, I can talk to you afterwards. The one liner of it is that we're supposed to look at uh, the various factors that influence uh, choice over um, the uh, over tools and strategies of, uh, for protecting kids from porn and other things on the net. So that's the one liner. Would you like to say your name and where you're uh, Ian Holtman in with the Parkman Company Code's office. Um, in an effort to close the digital divide a few years back, the 1996 Telecom Act authorized uh, what the FCC decided to take basically $2.5 billion a year uh, in fees and do uh, the schools and library funding for look for internet access, high speed internet access to schools and libraries. The Associated the American Library Association demands no filtering. Uh, the schools have inadequate supervision. We continue to fund this or continue to allow it to occur. Uh, and you're asking for more more uh, law enforcement, more education, more criminal control. Parents are out of the loop when it's in the schools and libraries. Everybody's being taken out of the loop. Is not the government culpable in introducing this or allowing access to uh, to all this the child pornography, adult pornography in the kids? I can actually address some of that. Um, the National Academy of Sciences is a In the omnibus spending bill in December, we rolled in a uh, provision called the Internet Filtering Service, which requires all schools.